I um, was born in Hamburg and, um, you know, when I was three and a half, my sister came along. So we were a family of four, you know, and um, I went to school like every other child. Uh, weekends we spent in, in our, you know, on the, on the sea, in our flat on the sea. And um, I was a busy girl, you know, doing a lot of activities, um, you know, handicrafts and playing a musical instrument and going to, the, you know, gymnastics and stuff like that. Um, I was um, very bubbly and very active and, um, yeah, and I had a very happy childhood. Actually, I had an imaginary friend before my sister was born, you know, when I was very little, I had this imaginary friend who was always with me that only I could see. And, um, well, when we grew up, we went to church, you know, um, we were taught about God and we prayed at night, a little prayer. And um, then, you know, we went to religious school education once a week as we got our confirmation and, um, and you know, so on, like young Christians do. But God didn't really, f um, I mean, religion didn't feature very much in our lives. You know, we didn't always pray before eating or my parents, you know, didn't go to church that regularly. It was just a certain time when we went to this religious education and then it kind of disappeared again, you know. And so when I was a teenager, I didn't go to church anymore. It was uncool um, and it, uh, the church didn't really speak to me as I was growing up. I, I must say I really liked the religious education. I liked the stories about Jesus and, you know, and the, and the Bible, the Bible and so on. But as I grew into being a teenager, the church didn't speak to me anymore, unfortunately. Um, you know, they try to have ballet performances and rock concerts in the church, but that doesn't really turn you to God, you know. And, um, and when I was a young adult, I just quit. I left the church. In a sense, I mean, I stopped paying, you know, the tax that you have to pay. And... Um, but I always had an interest for spirituality, you know, for the other world. I think I was born with this because, in fact, I later found out that my grandparents from my father's side were very religious, you know. And, in fact, there was a convert in, uh, from, Christ from Protestantism to Cath Catholicism in the family. And, um, you know, one of my cousins, great cousins, had become a priest. So there is a very strong religious vein in my family, but I, I had never really been exposed to it because my grandparents, you know, were already, you know, my grandmother was already has passed away and so on. And I was too little when, when they were still around to understand this. I only found out later. In fact, they were members of the Pentecostal Christian Church, which is a very experiential church, a very mystical church where they speak on tongue, in tongues, you know, they receive the Holy Ghost and, uh, and they experience uh, the spiritual dimension of Christianity. As a young person, I had an interest for the um, for spirituality. I, when I went to Amer I um, became an exchange student in, um, in America. I went to, to the United States uh, when I was 16 and 17 for a year, the junior high school, um, uh, and I, I lived in Portland, Oregon. They put me there, and um, I went to see the Bhagwan Ranch, you know, in Oregon, the famous Bhagwan Ranch in Oregon. Everybody dressed in red and orange, and um, twice a day when Bhagwan drove past, nowadays he's called Osho, I think they call him Osho, um, everybody bowed down in front of him, you know, and uh, he was passing by in this Rolls Royce. And I found it odd, even at that time, you know, how all those disciples could give their money to the spiritual leader who then has a massive collection of Rolls Royces and Rolex watches and how everybody bowed down in front of him, you know. Anyway, it was interesting and some of the teachings um, I found in a book were interesting, but, you know, those, uh, this mixture of commerce and spirituality didn't really gel for me. So um, anyway, um, you know, went back to London and, uh, sorry, back to Germany and continued my uh, studies. And then, but I already spoke English very well and I wanted to use my, my language skills, you know. So I 
kind of thought, where else could I go? You know, Hamburg was becoming too small again for me and I wanted to escape because I had already been on my own. I had been an independent person and, you know, then reverting back to being a child, being a daughter was a little bit difficult for me. So I wanted to, you know, break out again and, I mean, you know, and, and, and also use my language skills. So really London became this dream destination in my own head, you know, where I wanted to live. Um, because you use your English, but it's only one hour away from home. And um, so I tried to, um, I, uh, after my school, I went into journalism. I um, became, I did a traineeship at uh, Radio Hamburg, a private radio station in uh, Hamburg. And um, the, the boss, and you know, my first celebrity interview was with Keith Herring, this great graffiti artist. And um, my boss at the time, organized an interview with Capital Radio here in London. And um, I went, you know, to London for the big Nelson Mandela concert. Uh, there was a massive concert with all sorts of pop stars from Simple Minds to Brian Adams, you know, all in order to free Nelson Mandela. And um, a friend, a very close friend of mine had his 40th birthday, so I needed to get back a day earlier than this radio interview was. So I turned up a day early at Capital Radio for my interview and the boss wasn't too impressed. He said, sorry, you know, well, our appointment is tomorrow. I said, well, tomorrow I'm flying back already. So I guess it wasn't meant to be uh, with Capital Radio. But uh, then shortly afterwards, um, there was an ad in a local um, um, timeout in Hamburg saying MTV was looking for, for fresh wind. Uh, they were looking for a German presenter. Uh, MTV is a music television station, music television, you know, a music station that aired music videos. I, you know, it already it didn't exist in Europe at that time, but it was already on the air in America when I was living in America, but I never watched it only once or twice. Um, however, uh, this job ad would said, if you get the job, you have to move to London. So this was my reason to apply. And, um, you know, and anyway, I, I uh, cut a long story short, after half a year, I got the job. After half a year and a few auditions, I got the job with MTV and um, moved to London in 1989 to become the first German MTV presenter. This is one of my two golden autos, which is um, the prize I got for my youth show that I did in Germany. Uh, the one that sacked me the moment I became a Muslim. And uh, this is the golden camera. It's uh, the equivalent of uh, a BAFTA award. And I received that, I think, in 93, it says on there somewhere. Um, also, you know, for my work on TV, I guess, MTV and, um, and the youth show. So in 1989, my life changed, you know, suddenly from this little journalist in Hamburg, I became an international European celebrity, you know. I was in everybody's home in, um, on TV every day all around Europe. And we broadcast even in India and in the Middle East and in the Maghreb region, region you know. So, and um, I stayed for seven and a half years hosting all different shows on the channel, you know. Um, and also we traveled. I traveled once a month um, all around Europe to report from wherever something was happening. You know, I reported from the... I ran in the Olympics in 1992 in Barcelona. I still have my torch somewhere here. This is from the... Um, from the Olympics in uh, Barcelona, 1992. Uh, ran in the amateur run, you know, like uh, they had here the torch relay, you know. Uh, anyway, so, um, so you know, I went to the opening of Euro Disney. Interviewed Bob Geldof there. Uh, we went to some mega uh, football match in Istanbul, you know, wherever I opened. Um, I went to the opening of the Rolling Stones show in Boston. So even, you know, further afield we went. And um, it was... It was very special, you know, um, interviewing all sorts of um, major stars, you know, uh, all the big players in music um, and meeting them and going out with them and hanging out. You know, I went out at night here in London and told Europe what was happening on the scene the next day. You know, it, it was a very special time and... Um, and, uh, you know, and you can say I was the hot chick in town. I had three invitations every night, you know, I had to decide should I go with this film director or with this pop star or, you know, my God, how times have changed. <laughs> and um, anyway, so, um, so then at the height of my career, you see, 
it was fantastic. It was exciting. It was uh, new. You know, I learned to present uh, on TV every day. Um, also under tremendous pressure, we hosted massive live shows as well, live music shows, you know, once in front of 70,000 people in Germany, I, I hosted something, I came, I went on stage before the Prince, before Prince came on, you know, 70,000 people waiting for me, clapping and all of that. So, you know, it was, um, it was a great experience. I, I learned professionally, I really learned a lot and to, even to interview very famous people, you know, normally people get starstruck or get very nervous. And, you know, if you do it every day, you get used to it, to handle important people. So, um, on the one hand, it was a great challenge professionally. On the other hand, it was also very, rep very repetitive. You know, the same videos aired for three months. So we had to keep thinking of new ways of introducing the same old videos. And um, also, you know, uh, it was just music. It was just pop music. I mean, before at the radio station, I dealt with all different kinds of subjects, you know, politics, environment, art, design, you know, whatever it was, community issues. Here it was mainly pop music. And in order to keep my brain active, I signed up for all sorts of courses um, outside, you know, international relations, European history, film studies, whatever it was, you know, arts. And um, so basically, I was uh, mentally not really challenged enough. And, um, and really, you see, it was also a very hedonistic lifestyle and uh, a very external, uh, you know, the image counted. I had to look perfect all the time and perform and be perfect at all times. And, um, you know, when the show, you know, on show, basically during my shows and the show had to go on, you know, never mind what was happening in your private life. So it was also, there was a lot of pressure. And, you know, as a presenter, you have to always be this, you're the smiling front. Um, you have to have this, you know, this perfect uh, image when things go wrong backstage and, you know, there's arguments or the bands don't turn up. You have to present and pretend everything is fine. Um, so there was a lot of pressure and also, you know, rushing from one show to the next year in, year out, you know, eventually I felt, well, why am I doing all of this? You know, there was an emptiness inside. I can't really explain it. You know, there I, I am on stage in front of 70,000 people and then I go back to my own hotel room and it's silent and my ears are still ringing from the noise, you know. How do you come down from from this, you know, uh, rush and, um, you know, and there was an emptiness inside that I didn't know how to, to fill. I thought it was human love that I was missing. I was missing a boyfriend. I was single, you know. But in retrospect, I realized that no human being could have really filled that void. You know, it was, in fact, God that I was missing. It was um, an inner peace, you know, and a way to come to inner peace, and which is really attaching yourself to the divine. And um, that spiritual dimension was completely missing in my life, you know. And so obviously I, um, I was unsatisfied. I was unhappy despite having this high life, despite having this dream job. You know, uh, I wasn't really fully satisfied. And it was at a moment of crisis, really, that um, I met a Muslim who talked, who was just in the process of finding his faith. And it was uh, not any Muslim. It was, in fact, Imran Khan, a famous cricket star. He had just won the World Cup for Pakistan. It was in 92. I had no idea because I didn't know anything about cricket. You know, in Germany, we don't have cricket. And um, anyway, and he was telling me how he wants to give up his uh, high-flying cricketing career in order to build a hospital in Lahore. Now, that's a bit of a strange career decision. But he explained the essence of being a Muslim is to believe in God and to do good deeds and to serve God, you know. Anyway, um, I soon learned, uh, you know, an introduction to Islam. Um, he talked to me about, um, you know, the values, what it means to be a Muslim and, and his motivation. And then, you know, and he asked me out um, to join him with friends at some point. And um, I turned up in a mini dress and uh, he asked me if I would mind to keep on my coat for the rest of the evening. So, you know, in the entertainment business, it was all about if you've got it flaunted. You know, um, whereas now I was learning the concept of modesty. You know, he explained women and men 
don't show flesh in his culture. In fact, you know, they dress modestly. Um, and, you know, when I started uh, thinking about it more deeply, I actually agreed that perhaps it is degrading that women, you know, uh, advertise any kind of product from car tires to uh, cigarettes and alcohol on posters half naked, you know, with their bodies, basically. Um, and even now, I wonder why do women have to turn up in business meetings, you know, showing like all everything, whereas men are always wearing their suits. I mean, it's it is de degrading. And um, so I, I, I fairly quickly got that point and in fact changed my style of dress while I was working on MTV, you know, and I started wearing longer skirts and um, higher tops. And in fact, at the time, the fashion was grunge, so no one really um, noticed. <laughs> but, um, you know, as the fashion changed, my, my clothes stayed um, longer and I felt much more dignified and uh, more comfortable that way, you know? Who needs to be whistled at for their long legs? I mean, even now when you go out in the winter, in the freezing winter, women are wearing belts as skirts and then high heels like this. I don't know how you can walk on this and I mean, aren't people freezing? And then they freeze to death as we had a few women now freezing to death after they, you know, came home from a nightclub and couldn't find their key or something like that, you know. Anyway, it's it's all very uh, bizarre. And um, and I, I do feel uh, happy to, to, you know, nowadays to, to be more covered. I learned the concept of modesty through Imran and, and everything else really about Islam, um, slowly, slowly, but surely. I mean, you know, I... As he, I mean, he, he played Sufi music to me, um, Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a very big Pakistani singer singing about love, <coughs> love for the beloved, which turns into love for the ultimate beloved, you know, love for God. And, um, and you know, those lyrics really touched me um, in a way no pop song has done on MTV. You know, for example, uh, there's a, in my book, <laughs> there's a, my book which tells my story in depth, by the way. Um, I, I put one of those little um, poems, you know, written by a great uh, Sufi from the, uh, Sufi master from the subcontinent, you know, which is the sort of stuff that opened my heart at the time when I was presenting on MTV. Um, he wrote, his name is Bullishar, and he wrote, you have learned so much and read a thousand books. Have you ever read yourself? You have gone to the mosque and the temple. Have you ever visited your soul? You're busy fight on, fighting Satan. Have you ever fought your ill intentions? You have reached into the skies, but have you, but you have failed to reach what's in your heart. So, you know, so let's basically look into our hearts and our souls. And that is really where the seat of God and where we can find our peace and our divine spark and where it's at, really. Um, so anyway, um, you know, the journey continued. I listened to more Sufi music. I started reading books on Islam. In fact, the very first book um, Imran gave me was called Man and Islam by Ali Shariati. And it really spoke to me, you know. He talked about um, how the soul is entrapped in the cage of the body and how it longs to attach itself to the divine and how you can do this through love and uh, faith. And, um, you know, and he criticized our civil society here in the West where civilizational diseases are on the increase, like depression, you know, and all sorts of mental problems, health problems, and we don't know what to do about it. Families are breaking down, you know, and how civil is that when we don't even look after the old, after our elderly people, you know, and stick them in homes. So, I mean, he had a lot of good points in, in this book. And I continued reading, you know, Gay Eaton, um, The Destiny of Man and Islam, Islam and the Destiny of Man, and um, Martin Ling's The Beautiful Biography on the Prophet, Peace Be Upon Him, and uh, Muhammad Assad, uh, Road to Mecca. He was uh, a Jew, Leopold Weiss, and, um, and became a journalist. I mean, he was a journalist, in fact, uh, in the 1930s and became a Muslim and one of the scholars of Islam. And he translated 
uh, the Quran into English, um, a very popular translation. And, you know, he, so, um, so I read it, I continued reading books on Islam ever since. And, um, you know, and I was just, you know, it was mind blowing what I found. I found a whole new universe. And I found a lot of commonalities. And I, but then I learned that really Islam is a continuation of Christianity. It's not something separate um, or something altogether foreign or alien. It's, it's actually a, a continuation of Christianity. And, you know, and all the concepts I was reading about God is one. He, um, you know, we worship him and him alone and directly. And, um, you know, and he's the source and destiny of everything in, in this universe and all the other universes. And, you know, we are responsible for our own deeds. We're not born as sinners and someone else has taken away all our sins already. I mean, it, it is logical. The message just makes sense. And, you know, as I was reading with an open heart and an open mind, I realized, you know, this is the truth. It, it's, I couldn't escape it, you know. And, um, however, I had questions about women issues. You know, are women not treated as second-class citizens? Are women not uh, suppressed um, in Islam. And then Imran asked me to uh, travel with him to Pakistan to enjoy or to visit him. And, um, you know, with a few friends, we went on some hiking trips and I paid particular attention to how women were treated and how I was treated as a Westerner. And I must say, you know, everybody I met treated me with great respect, you know, and addressed me as a sister and didn't flirt with me in, 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 in uh, an inappropriate manner, you know, which happens so much here. But, um, you know, I felt I was I was really well respected. And I mean, what particularly touched me was the warmth and the generosity and the kindness of the Muslims I met, you know. Um, and we traveled high up the mountains and, you know, to a place beyond Hunza, Hunza, where the famous apricot comes from, you know, where people live on top of their animals, they're so so poor so the natural heat of the body of the animals you know keeps them warm and they have no satellite dishes no running water or anything and yet you know they were dignified they um they were generous even you know they offered us whatever they had almonds nuts um uh, apricots that they were drying with a bismillah in the name of god and i was um you know i i liked the fact how much God featured in people's lives, how how God was really at the center of people's lives, and um, how people could be so generous despite their dire poverty, you know. And um, and it really made me reflect and made me think and reevaluate um, my life in the West, which, you know, was um, so different. And we got annoyed for very, um, you know, inane reasons. And, you know, and here people were really um, struggling with, with the essentials and um, seemed to bear it, you know, with dignity. So, and I had a lot of incidents, you know, um, uh, as I was shuttling between the worlds, which I write about in my book, you know, how I was touched and um, by by the way Muslims dealt, you know, with issues in life, with challenges, with um, you know how 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 it can work in a very different way uh, to how to what we're used to, you know. So um, yeah, I continued reading for three years and meeting Muslims, asking questions, and so on. And um, I mean, I'm writing, you know, there were, of course, some challenges uh, in the Quran, you know, the verse, was it uh, in Surah 3, verse 34, this famous beating verse. And it took me 19 years to get to the bottom of that. You know, I had to leave it aside um, uh, because I couldn't get satisfactory answers for a very long time. But um, all, overall, you know, the spirit of the Quran and, um, you know, the message overall is sublime and um, and is, you know, and we're not meant to nitpick and, and find, uh, you know, criticize little points if we can't understand, you know, with our mere human uh, comprehension or beginner's way of seeing things, then it's best to leave certain things behind and come back to them later. So that's what I did. And after three years of studying and reading and uh, meeting people, 
Um, eventually, uh, you know, uh, Imran, we weren't friends anymore, basically. Um, I was ready. I wanted to embrace Islam. I wanted to bring God into my life. In fact, I wanted to practice. You know, I wanted to pray. I realized that, um, you know, all the reading in the world won't uh, really get me there, won't uh, allow me to feel what it means being a Muslim, you know. So I realized the only way to actually taste the spiritual fruits we're reading, I was reading about was to get down on my prayer mat and practice and, you know, become a Muslim, basically. So that was um, in 95, in April 1995. And I converted in a um, North London mosque, um, uh, you know, and uh, became a Muslim. It's been challenging um, ever since. Uh, I never came back on German television, you know, since being a Muslim, except for five minutes a week, once upon a time, for, you know, 10 years later or something like that. And that is, uh, is uh, you know, just strange. Um, but there you are. It's, um, and that really is also the reason, you know, why I wrote my book, because I realized there's so much um, negativity towards Islam. You know, it's such, it has such a bad image. And um, people don't really know, even in Britain, one in four British people don't think Islam is compatible with British life. And that is really, you know, it's very sad. I mean, um, nowadays, information is publicly available and people still, you know, have that opinion, even here in Britain. And, and Britain is the best place for Muslims in Europe. And this is the reason why I live here, why I never went back to Germany, because of what happened to me. But it's also the reason why I wrote my book, From MTV to Mecca, because I'm trying to dispel some prejudices, you know, and, um, and, and show if I, as an MTV, former MTV presenter, living at the forefront of popular culture, can find my happiness and, and peace in Islam, there must be something to it, you know. So I take the reader by the hand as I'm overcoming my prejudices and, you know, my experiences, which I shared, some of, you, some of them I shared with you now, you know, I'm telling in more detail and um, trying to show um, you know, as I learn about Islam while I was working on MTV, I'm sharing, you know, these teachings um, uh, slowly with the reader and taking them, you know, in. So really, it's, a, it's an introduction um, to Islam. It's a, a dawah, a book for dawah. And it's also a great support for other new Muslims, you know, who, who are faced with the same problems. Like, how did my family react? My family wasn't happy I became Muslim, you know. They were wondering, well, if you don't get married to this guy, why do you have to take up his religion? You know, they didn't understand. And because they just read um, Islam in the media, you know, and, and that's what happens usually to, to families of reverts, you know. They don't know anything about Islam than what you read in the media, and it's negative. So it's very difficult, you know, how do you educate them? So even the book was a great education for my parents. And, um, and, you know, now they see it gives me happiness. They see it gives me inner contentment. And, you know, and also, in fact, it has made me a more conscientious family member. You know, um, my parents now are more important. My family is more important than my friends. Before it was always my friends were more important. So they benefit in a way, you know. And what else has Islam given me? Well, it has given me inner satisfaction, inner uh, strength, um, you know, hope, um, and just a whole different way of seeing the world. You know, now I do everything in relation to God. You know, I ask myself, is this, is this good? Is this pleasing to God before I do it? Before I didn't have that, you know? And so, also, I'm not lonely anymore. Um, you know, I'm always in the best of companies, and I have this internal dialogue with God all the time this uh, source to draw on, to connect with at all times, you know. Like when I travel nowadays, it's wonderful. You just, you go on your prayer mat, you find out where Mecca is, you connect with God. Before I didn't have that. So, um, alhamdulillah, you know, I really feel enriched thanks to this, um, thanks to the faith. So, um, yeah, eventually I went uh, on Umrah, alhamdulillah. And then later on, I also went on Hajj um, in uh, 2006. I had the great honor to, uh, you know, to, to go to Mecca. 
um, in January 2006. And, um, you know, it was really, it's the journey of a lifetime. It's, um, you know, you stand there before God. And I really can only recommend to anybody to do it while, while you're young, while you are physically fit, you know, to really get the benefit for it. And especially to get the benefit for it for the rest of your life. I don't know why people want to go when they're really, really old. They want to sin all their life and then go and go on Hajj and have it all forgiven at the end of their lives. Why? Why not go before and then try hard to keep the Hajj, to live a clean life? Um, so Alhamdulillah, you know, it was a challenge on all, in all ways. Physical challenge, a massive physical challenge. You know, you don't sleep, you get sick. I mean, I felt like a zombie after a few days, or the burning throat, you know, lack of sleep and sick and sneezing and, and in pain and, you know, and um, but because you want to be in, in the Haram Sharif all the time and in, in the holy mosques in Mecca and in Medina and, um, and everybody else is sick, so you can't avoid the Hajj flu. But, um, you know, then you're really carried by spiritual energy. And, um, and it's, it's a challenge also in, in an interpersonal way, you know, you spend time with strangers in a very close, enclosed space, you know, we shared our room with 10 other women and, you know, we only had three bathrooms for 50 women, you know, it was a hardship hajj I went on, it wasn't a five-star luxury hajj and, um, you know, but it was a blessing. It was, I enjoyed every moment of it. You know, it was wonderful. In the end, we all asked for forgiveness for each other. Before we were in Medina in these tight flats, you know, and, and before we went to Mecca, one woman asked, you know, if I could forgive her for all, all the wrongs, all the offenses she had done against me. And I said, well, there was nothing, don't worry. And, and then I asked for forgiveness. We all asked each other for forgiveness, you know, and your hearts just melt and we wanted to come completely clean to, to Mecca. And it's, it's just so wonderful what you experience between people as well, you know. And uh, you, you're close to tears many times just from what happens. One woman in, in the Haram Sharif, you know, um, just handed me a prayer book from, I think, Hussein it was, you know, and she made a space for me because some man, you know, was rude to me in the front, some hot-headed man and told me to move away. And then this Iranian woman made space for me in the back with the women and gave me this prayer book. She said it always reaches the right person. It was meant to be for some friend of her, but she never turned up. So she gave it to me. And then I ended up reading these beautiful prayers, you know, on, um, on the day of Arafat and this heart wrenchingly beautiful prayers, you know. And um, yeah, you know, and it's, it's just, it's so special. They say on Arafat, there's so many angels around. If you would throw a needle, you would hurt an angel, you know. And it's, uh, it's that special time during, I think, Asr time, around Asr time, though, you know, that everybody goes out and asks for forgiveness. And it symbolizes Judgment Day, the big day. And um, no, I, I just loved it, you know, and really the challenge is afterwards when you when you come back and you know you you want to keep your hajj and don't fall back into your old ways you know or old mistakes so i've been trying very hard ever since <laughs> and uh, inshallah may god accept you know you know and strangely really since the hajj my life changed again in a better way you know um because in fact, it came out in the German press that I went on Hajj and it was received very positively. So positively that one article after the other followed. Um, oh, XMTV presenter has been on Hajj on this big pilgrimage, something really nice. And then a book agent came to me and asked me, wouldn't I like to write my story in a book? So that's how the original book came about, von MTV nach Mecca, the German book, which was published in, in 2009. And so it really was only since then that I've been more, you know, that I've been outspoken about being a Muslim and trying to tell everybody about uh, the beautiful faith. You know, before I told you I was hounded in the press in 95 and I've kept quiet ever since because my agents at the time told me, if you ever want to work again in Germany, you better keep quiet about Islam because it's such a negative image. So I never said anything anymore for all these years until my Hajj. You know, until it came out in the press and 
was so suddenly so positively received and then even you know my book um i got the contract for a book and since the book you know i've been invited all around i mean also since the book came out in english it came out in england um, only last year in september you know and since this book came out I've had so many incredible invitations all around Germany, all around the United Kingdom, even to Canada to speak in front of 16,000 Muslims um, and well, people say, because some weren't Muslims. And, um, you know, and the reception has always been really positive. And I even, um, you know, I did a big interview on Al Jazeera um, and uh, that was watched by the entire Arab world and also including by the royal family of Sharjah. And they invited me on a visit to meet and to speak at one of their conferences. And, you know, all sorts of incredible doors have opened, alhamdulillah. And it's been, um, you know, I was part of the Inspired by Muhammad campaign. Then suddenly I was nominated an ambassador of the Exploring Islam Foundation. And uh, they made me one of the faces of the Inspired by Muhammad campaign, which was a media campaign in 2010. All over London for a few weeks, there were posters on tubes, on um, bus shelters and in taxis, promoting slogans of our noble prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, my slogan was, I believe in protecting the environment. So did Mohammed, you know, and there were other slogans about coexistence, about women's rights. And, you know, that caused a big media stir. I was on BBC Question Time, on all different other uh, channels, you know, did interviews, again, showing the beautiful values of Islam, because it, Islam really needs some true PR. People don't know anything about it. They don't know that Mary is in the Quran. They don't know that Jesus is the prophet of Islam. They don't know, you know, all the commonalities we have. So again, that's why I wrote the book. That's why I, I am an ambassador for the Exploring Islam Foundation. And again, um, nowadays I'm also a patron of uh, the Tell Mama campaign um, by the interfaith organization Faith Matters. It's a campaign against Islamophobia, where they're trying to log all the Islamophobic um, offenses and attacks uh, that, that happen against um, people of Muslim faith. And uh, they're trying to lobby and trying to change uh, the, uh, the law, in fact, that this is not allowed anymore, something very positive. So, you know, I'm more active now in trying to make a contribution um, in terms of, um, you know, dialogue between Islam and the West and promoting the positive values. And recently I've um, produced a television show, MTV to Mecca, which is a cultural show featuring contemporary Muslim culture and lifestyle that I'm trying to place um, uh, on TV, uh, again, to inspire you know, non-Muslims, to show them the beauty in all its different facets of Islam, you know, art, fashion, design, inspirational people, lifestyle, how we break fast, you know, the, the cuisine, or how we uh, celebrate the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, etc. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to find a channel who would like to air this, you know, uh, as an inspiration to Muslims and non-Muslims alike, inshallah. Well, the future, as you know, is uh, only Allah knows the future. But I'm, I'm hoping to place this show uh, on TV so we can make a difference. We can, you know, I'd love to get back onto, into television, which is really what I do best. And um, I'd like to use my skills that I've gained in the entertainment industry for the service of Allah, you know. And um, I would love to find an, an opening there. And, of course, also get my book published again in different uh, languages. You know, there's an Indonesian edition coming out, Malaysian, and we're working on the Arabic. Would be nice to have a Turkish uh, edition and uh, maybe Farsi as well, you know, to again, to inspire people. And, you know, that's it really, to use my skills in the service of God in whatever way I can. That's what I dream. <laughs>